All right. Okay, so thanks for joining everyone. I'm super excited to be here today. So my name is Lindsay Murphy and I'm the Director of Data and Analytics at Maple. I currently lead a team of three analytics engineers and one data analyst and I'm based in Toronto, Canada. So just a little bit about Maple, we're a Canadian virtual healthcare company and using the Maple app or website, Canadians can connect directly to a doctor anywhere, anytime in less than 10 minutes and we're available 24 seven. We're currently being recognized as one of Canada's fastest growing companies. And a quick outline of my talk today. So I'll spend a little bit of time discussing the early stages of uh, data and data quality at Maple. I'll talk a little bit about our journey so far and how we've been working on managing our data quality. And then I'll finish up by uh, talking about what we're gonna focus on next to continue improving as we scale. Before I get into the talk too far, uh, I wanted to take some time to share a quick overview of our tech stack. This is as it is today, not as it was in, in the beginning of our journey, but uh, we focus a lot on Maple application data, so data from the application itself. Uh, and we also bring in data from various other SaaS applications. We use uh, tools like Fivetran and Stitch to bring data into our data warehouse Redshift. We currently use DBT CLI to transform and prepare data. And we use GitHub Actions to orchestrate uh, some of our workflows. Looker is our BI tool. Uh, and we have more recently been using Jupyter Notebooks to do more deep dive analysis and some light data science. And our main consumers of data at Maple are internal uh, employees. So we, we really focus heavily on self-serve analytics. And we also send some reports quarterly and monthly to external partners and clients. So taking us back in time to January 2020, feels like a very long time ago, that was when the data and analytics team launched at Maple. And at that time, our, our team was one VP and one data analyst. And that group of two got uh, quickly to start on setting up DBT and building out our initial infrastructure of models. And when they did this, they started uh, you know, taking advantage of basic DBT tests. So building things in like not null and unique tests uh, and accepted values tests. And really our focus uh, back then and even now is really on coverage of testing. So this is our model testing conventions that we use then and we still follow these today. Uh, and we really focus on coverage and testing assumptions across all of our models, whether it's staging, intermediate or core model. So even though those things may be redundant, we really focus a lot on coverage. The next thing we did after we started setting up some of these tests was we, we needed a way to automate our test runs. And so we built a GitHub Actions workflow that will run all of our tests every single night. And so this was really great. Uh, it created you know, an, some automation for us, but it meant that um, you know, if there was a test failure, somebody would have to go look in the GitHub Actions log. And this essentially was a manual step. So we had one data analyst, you know, if they maybe forgot or if they were busy that day, a test failure might go unnoticed. And so it wasn't it's a super reliable methodology. So the next thing that we did was add uh, automated Slack alerts. So again, with our GitHub Actions workflow, we added a Slack webhook that would take any test failures and populate those in our Slack uh, data alerts channel that we created. So that was pretty neat and it was definitely an improvement from where we were, um, but it created some new issues for us. So at the time we had grown from a team of one analytics engineer to now we had three people on the team and it really created this problem of assigning ownership and responsibility. So uh, at the time, our three AEs were all assigned to different departments uh, of the business. And so if there was a test failure, our general rule at the time was, you know, if this fails in your area of the business, or if you know the most about this model, you should pick it up and solve it. And not only was that not really fair for resourcing, it also wasn't really good for our bus factor, which is the risk associated with, you know, all of the information and capabilities on a team being shared among being uh, stored in one person and not really mm. among the team. So the next thing we did was implement an on-call rotation. And we've called this uh, air traffic control or ATC. And essentially what this is, is every week a different person on the team is on ATC and their responsibilities will cover managing any test failures that come in our Slack channel, um, monitoring another help Slack channel. So if people are having trouble with Looker or any, find any data issues, they would manage those and then dealing with any other issues that might come up. So things like five trainer stitch failures or redshift issues. So this has helped us in a few different ways. First, it avoids decision fatigue. So uh, if someone's on ATC, they know that they're responsible for fixing that uh, test failure that arise that week. Secondly, it reduces that bus factor that I mentioned by sharing knowledge across the team. And if someone's on ATC and they're unfamiliar with why a test is failing, they can reach out to a team member to get some support and learn a bit more about that area of the business. 
Thirdly, it imp implements some fairness and resourcing. I put some here in brackets because uh, some weeks are worse than others. And so you can't really predict when you're going to have a bad ATC week, but it usually comes out in the wash. And lastly, it helps us avoid missing test failures or having repeated test failures multiple days in a row because we're able to action things a lot faster. And so we've actually noticed this when we look at some of the data. Uh, so if we look at over the past couple quarters, we typically have anywhere between 10 to 20 test failures per quarter, which amounts to about one to one and a half per week. Uh, and so we've actually noticed since implementing ATC that we've actually reduced our mean time to resolve test failures. And now the majority of them are solved in the same day, which is great. So while we're really proud of the progress that we've made, uh, we, we do definitely still have some things that we want to work on. And this would include uh, scaling our conventions. So as you can imagine, with our testing conventions the way that they are, we have a lot of tests. Uh, we have about four, just over 400 models and we have over 4,000 tests right now. So our test runtime, as you can imagine, is really ballooning as we scale. So we're definitely going to need to adopt a bit of a different strategy to uh, ensure that we have you know, good coverage, but it's not coming at the cost of efficiency. Another thing we've talked about is having different levels of test priority. So right now, all of our test failures are treated the same. We typically look into them right away and try to fix them as soon as possible. As we scale, this is probably also not an, something we can continue. We may need to have different levels of test priority by using things like DBT tags. And lastly, we wanted to put some more automation into our process. So creating JIRA tickets uh, automatically when uh, there is a test failure or excluding repeated test failures that haven't been resolved within the same day so we can avoid noise. Some of the tools that we're looking in to help us with some of these scaling challenges, uh, the first one is elementary data. So this is an open source uh, data observability platform. And what we're hoping to use this for is to monitor test failure rates over time and really try to understand you know, how, are, how well are we scaling our testing strategy. Uh, another thing this will help us with is we can actually get rid of the manual Slack alerting that we built and we can start using elementary Slack alerting. And we'll also be able to add anomaly detection, which would be really helpful. We're also interested in adding data fold to our workflow. So we don't currently use this, but we've been uh, investigating adding this to our workflow because a lot of our focus right now is on the reactive side of data quality. And we're hopeful that by adding data fold to our process that we'll actually be able to focus a bit more on prevention of data quality and maybe reduce some of the amounts of test failures that we're having. So that is everything. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, just a quick follow-up question uh, from the poll that I just published. Um, it looks like a few people are curious, what is on-call practice? So the, the poll asked, do you have on-call practice for a data team? By the way, um, go ahead and vote. But yeah, could you could you um, share a little bit more light on what, what is the on-call practice and um, what does it get the team? Yeah, so essentially we have uh, we basically created this process where every week a different person will be assigned to this on-call rotation. And so during that week, their responsibilities would include uh, addressing any test failures that come up or uh, answering any questions that we have from our internal stakeholders. And so we, uh, in our quarterly planning, we bake some additional time into resourcing. And so we kind of assume that people are going to spend a few hours on this every week. And if you're on ATC for that week, you you know you probably won't focus on some of your other big projects if there's a lot of test failures coming up. So that's generally how we we've implemented that process. Awesome, thanks for clarifying. Great, so we'd like to.